out because I have a mansion. In fact, I can see my mansion from here. Can you see it? How, how is it you're going to see it? Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 1 says, By faith, or it says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. As the Hebrews writer tells us that by faith we can see things that wouldn't otherwise be seen. When he uses the term substance, he's talking about a foundation. It's that which stands under. And so when you're standing on a firm foundation, you have solid ground. We can see a lot of things by standing on this vantage point of faith that we would not otherwise be able to see. As you continue through on the chapter, you're introduced to characters of the Old Testament, people that lived by faith. Like, for instance, you read about Abel in verse 4, Enoch in verse 5. You drop down and you find out about Noah in verse 7. And then you get to Abraham. And the way that Abraham is introduced here is particularly interesting, where in the Hebrews writer says, By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should have to receive for an inheritance, obeyed, and he went out not knowing whither he went. He didn't know where he was going to go. That knowledge was going to come later, but he trusted God. It says, By faith, he sojourned in the land of promise, as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs of him with the same promise. For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Then he talks briefly about Sarah, and he talks about some other things. And you drop down to verse 13, and the Hebrews writer says, These all died in faith, not having received the promises. Okay? So the Hebrews writer is trying to give me encouragement to be like these guys were, but I find out that they live their life in discomfort not ever receiving the fulfillment of the promises. Seems like a strange way to encourage somebody, doesn't it? But we continue on reading, and you read about other characters of the Old Testament, you realize that they were playing the long game, you see? They believed that the receipt of the promises was not necessarily in this life. They were looking for something better. You go on down, and you see in verse 16, but now they desire a better country that is in heavenly. Wherefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. They've got a mansion. They can see it. If you ask to see it, they might show you God's word, God's promises, but they're not going to walk you to the address and say, see, there it is, because it's not here, it's over there. As you continue on in the book of Hebrews, you're going to read in verse 24 of, of chapter 11, By faith Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God, than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. You see, reading about Moses, you learn that he made a choice. He had two paths set before him. He could have chosen the path of enjoying and experiencing all of the joy and all of the comforts of this life in Egypt, but he chose affliction. He chose the affliction. He made a choice. And he chose rather than to enjoy the comforts of Egypt, to take the affliction. As you read on, you're going to find in chapter 12, you're going to find another person who made a choice in verse 16. When we read about Esau, he warns them about not failing the grace of God. And then as one example of somebody who did fail the grace of God, he talks about Esau. He says, lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who, for one morsel of meat, sold his birthright. Y'all know me, and y'all know I like made-up words sometimes because sometimes they kind of illustrate what's going on in the text better than words that we commonly use. When you look at Moses, you can see that he rathered, you know? <coughs> he rathered be with God's people, even if it meant affliction, than be with the Egyptians, even though it meant comfort. When you look at Esau, you see that he rathered. He rathered a cup of soup rather than just to hang on to his birthright and endure a little bit. He could have gone and made his own soup. So he rathered wrong, whereas Moses rathered right. But we turn our attention back to the idea of how it is that God is trying to motivate us not to give up. And you remember the Hebrew people having once obeyed the gospel that you read about in Hebrews chapter 6. You know, they had tasted these things, they had enlightenment and all of the good things they had. They had obeyed the gospel and under the heavy persecution, they were actually thinking, maybe we should go back. Maybe we should give up. 
And the question that's set before them, they had a choice that was set before them. There was a race set before them which required endurance. This choice that was set before them is, you can enjoy the comforts of this world going on about your business as a regular Jewish person worshiping under the law of the Jews. Or you could suffer this affliction for a short period of time. You make the choice. And while you're making that choice, there's something that you need to think about. And that's where you get to chapter 12, verse 1. Where he writes, Wherefore, seeing we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Now picture this before we get to the next. There we are at the judgment. And God is asking me, he says, Jeff, why did you rather wrongly? I say, well, you know, it was really hard being just one of a few people. And Noah's over there as a witness saying, really? I think, well, I didn't really know where this is going. And Abraham's going, that didn't really stop me. I think about all the prophets and some of those who were sawn asunder. And I say, it just took too much physical effort. And I think about what they went through. And they're looking at me as one of the great cloud of witnesses saying, you gave up, why? But he says, wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. In other words, you need to choose correctly. And then he says in verse 2, some advice to help you do that. Here's the encouragement. He says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Now we're reading about Jesus. And when I read that he went through these things despising the shame, the term that's used for, dis, uh, for despise is a derivative of the term that's used for consider there in verse 1. I want you to think hard about this, and I want you to work this into the evaluation when you're doing your rathering. I want you to take this into account. And he's telling us, consider Jesus, who did not take into account how much suffering was going to be and the shame involved with it. He didn't think about that. He thought about the right things rather than focusing on the things that made it hard. That's what he focused on. But then instead, you read there in verse 2, he says, Who for the joy that was set before him? I've heard a lot of great sermons preached on this, talking about the joy that was set before him being the fellowship that Jesus Christ would have with the Father after his resurrection. I've heard sermons talking about how this would be the resurrection itself or that it was the joy of knowing that God's people could be saved. And as nice as those homilies are, it really doesn't fit the text because you see the term for here is the exact same term used in verse 16 for for, which is almost always translated instead of or rather than or in exchange for. When you think about Jesus in Matthew chapter 4, Satan was presenting things to him, appealing to his lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and pride of life. But he rathered correctly in each of those situations. And rather than experiencing the joy which one can have, the comfort which one can have from this life, like some of his Jewish brethren were doing, he chose instead to go to the cross. He chose the cross. What is it that you're choosing rather than being faithful to God. Are you rathering correctly? There is a race that's set before you that you're going to need endurance to run. And there's a great cloud of witnesses saying, you can do it because we did it. Some people are like Esau. They're exchanging their salvation for a cup of soup, the physical comforts. Some in the book of Hebrews, like Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 24, were forsaking the assemblies because, you know, that could cause them some trouble if somebody caught them going to church might be some persecution. It's rather just stay home and be comfortable. All the things that you read about, the people who have given up the faith for to stay comfortable, the joys that they have in the here and now, they rathered wrongly. But Jesus Christ did what was right. And by doing so, he procured salvation for each and every one of us. Jesus Christ himself said, what profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his soul? And what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? What will you give up? For Jesus Christ? And more importantly, will you give up Jesus Christ for the things of this world? Are you a child of God this morning, or do you identify with the world, seeking after the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life? Give those things up. Lay them aside. They're the weights. They're the sins that are going to set you back. Get rid of them. Put them out of your life. 
Put on Jesus Christ by obeying the gospel plan of salvation. If you need to know more about how to do that, we can study with you. If you're a child of God and you've gotten tangled up with the trappings of this world and you've not chosen correctly, you have an opportunity this afternoon to get right as together we stand and sing.